And so we're going to be in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2. We're going to actually read a few verses, but uh, there's a couple verses that I just want to start off with. Luke chapter 2, verse 39. It says this, when Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. Verse 40. There the child, the child being Jesus, grew up healthy and strong. He was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. So I'm going to pray real quick, and then we'll jump into this third installment of Holy Shifts. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together uh, in person as a community, God, that just wants to, to learn a little bit more about you, God. And so I pray, Father, that you would just uh, speak this morning. Jesus, you said that uh, your word is only as good as our heart. And so I pray right now that you would just give our hearts good soil, that when the word falls, it would produce something in our lives, that we would grow, we'd become better, but not for our own benefit, but so that we can change the world around us. God, we love you so much. We honor you in Jesus' name. Come on, everyone say it. Amen. 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 Hey, so I don't know if you've noticed this, but dads are a little bit crazier than moms. I don't know what it is. I, I don't know. And that was a really huge generalization. So if you're offended, I apologize for that. Uh, but like dads, like, I don't know what it is, but like we don't think sometimes, you know, like we do things with our kids. And we're like, hey, this seems like a great idea. And then uh, it's like, no, it's really not a great idea. And so um, I was actually thinking about how, how this comes out, comes to play. And I remember when I was young, my dad, he used to take my sister and I when we were like very little, like very little. And he would put us on his lap when he was driving. And he would say, you want to drive? And we're like, yeah, of course. And, <laughs> and so we're like five sitting on his lap driving on the highway. I'm just kidding. We weren't on the highway. <laughs> We weren't on the highway. Dads aren't that crazy. Uh, but, like, we would, we would sit on his lap, and he, would, and he would let us drive. And I remember, like, this is so cool. I'm, like, two, and I'm driving, you know. And, uh, and I just remember thinking, man, this is amazing. And so I was so touched by it, in fact, that, uh, that I, cr I carry this tradition on with my kids. And so I've done this with my, my boy, who's now 11, I didn't do it with my daughter because she's just, it's precious cargo, right? Like, can't mess that up. But then, like, my youngest, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but my youngest, like, he's just, he just turned, or he's about to turn four. So we started when he was three. Started him young. And, and so, like, so, like, my boys, I'm like, hey, you guys want to drive? They're like, yeah. And, hey, we'll cut this from the stream, too. So <laughs> I'm not trying to get called on CPS or CPA. ABC, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> it's important, guys. It's important. Don't be offended. Um, and uh, focus, Sean. So, so I, I, I put my, 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 my oldest, like, he, I let him drive since he was, like, three years old. And, um, and it's, like, in safe places, right? Like, not, not, not anything where it's going to affect anybody. But my youngest, uh, we, so I drop him off at my parents' house. They, um, they are not just grandparents, but they're amazing grand sitters, right? And so uh, they, watch, they watch my son. And so uh, we created this thing, my, um, myself and my youngest, where uh, when we pull in uh, to the, the driveway of where my parents are, he says, Daddy, unbuckle. And I'm like, okay. So he unbuckles, he climbs forward, and he sits on my lap, and, I, and he just like, I, I'm obviously, I have the gas on. He's just driving. You know, oh, thank you. Thank you. One person affirming my father's skills, and I appreciate that. And uh, so, so he, like, we're just driving, right? And, and like, he, he, he stinks at it. Like, he's horrible, right? Like, like there's people coming, and we're like, uh, I'll grab the steering wheel, because I'm like, no, because he swerves. Um, he, he doesn't drive. He's, it doesn't matter. And so, like, He's just, he's just, and so, um, so here's what's crazy, and I'm getting somewhere, I promise, guys, I promise. Here's what's funny is that, like, every time he starts veering, I, I grab the steering wheel, and he hits my hand. He's, like, <laughs> as if to say, no, Dad, I got this. Like, leave me alone. You don't know what you're doing, you know? And so, uh, so, so we're driving, right? And, and, and he does that, 
And uh, we make it every single time, like we make it to our destination. But, but while we're driving, like I'm helping him get to the destination. Okay? And I was thinking about this, like there's really three, um, if, if, if you do this, if you want to do this, okay, with your kid or your grandkid or just like some random kid, like here's, <laughs> no, don't do that, which is a random group. Um, <laughs> Uh, there, there's really three methods of doing this, really, okay? And I'm just going to fill you in, dads, moms, uh, grandparents, and just everyone. So, so the first method is this, like not to do it, okay? That's the first method. You can just be like, hey, you're not doing this. They're like, dad, can I drive? I'm three. You're like, no. Mom, can I drive? No, right? Like, so th there's that. That's option one. Option two is like, to, and this is extreme, but you can be like, hey, as soon as you reach the pedals, I'm just going to sit on the passenger side. <laughs> And you just and you just like you just do your thing, right? Like that's option three, which I don't recommend that one. Um, but then there's option two, and this is the one that my son hates, but I think is wise. Is that uh, he, he just gets on my lap again, like I was telling you, and 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 I hold the steering wheel on the bottom, and I help him get to where he's trying to go. Now, here's why I'm telling you this story, or, or this like this uh, is it, it, because it's. I'm trying to tie it in. I'm like, wait a second. It doesn't even fit. No, we'll make it fit. We'll make it fit. Um, but, but the reason why I'm telling you this is because I actually think within those three options are three models of parenting that we can see. Now, they're broad models of parenting, but I think that these are three models of parenting that, that, that we see, that we can be, that we can become. So here's model number one of parenting. I'm not going to let you do anything. Stay away. Come here. If this is your baby, stay away. Mom, Dad, can I? No, you cannot. Can I please? No. Mom, Dad, like, can I shut up? Right? Like, that's, not, that's the first model, right? Like, we're like, don't touch. You can't. Guard. Right? For Christians, we call them hedges. Right, like we're putting hedges around our kids, and um, and we're like, no, no, no. Okay, that's all, that's that's the first model of parenting. Which, if you're like that, hey, more power to you, love it. Option two, second model of parenting is like, hey, do whatever you want. Can I? Yeah, for sure. Go. Is it cool if? Yep, no problem. Go ahead. And there's that. And if that's you, and you're here, welcome. We're glad that you're here. So we have model one, we have model two, and then we got model three. And this is actually, I think this is the best model. I actually think scripture backs this model up. But, this, but model three is parenting to where I'm purposely helping my child get to the destination they're supposed to get to. And that's the method, that's the model that I want us to talk about this morning. And a little disclaimer um, I am far from perfect at this, at what we're talking about today. Like, you can ask my kids. They, they'll tell you, they'll be like, my daddy, he's, he loves me. I know this. This I know. But he's also, he loses it sometimes. So, like, this is not, this, like, this, I don't, like, I, I can't stand when people come up and they're like, this is how you do it. And I have it all right. And it's, right? I'm like, chill, man. Like, try to make me feel. So, I just, I want to put that disclaimer out there that I don't have this all made, but this is stuff that I am working on continuously, you know. And so, so method three, the, hey, I'm going to help my kid get to the destination that they're supposed to get to. And so the reason why I said I think this is actually backed up by scripture is because we read in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, it says this. <laughs> <laughs> Start children off on the way that they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Let's keep that verse up there so we can break it down a little bit. It says, start children off the way that they should go. So as a parent, it's my job to help my kids navigate to get started in the direction that they should go. Now, let's break that part down because that's interesting. In the direction that they should go. That they should go. Now, if you're a parent instantly... You're like, okay, you read it like this, in the way that I think they should go. 
So it's my job to get my kids to go in the direction that I think they should go. I actually don't think that's what that translation means. I don't think what that's what that verse means. Or, or it's easy to, to read it to let, let my kids choose the direction that they should go. I don't think that's it either. In fact, I think that this implies to when, when it says that in the way that they should go, it implies the destination that was set by the designer. So, so start children off on the way that they should go. So it's not the way that I think that they should go, but it's my job to help them navigate to get to the destination set by their designer, also known as God. So it is my job as a parent to help them navigate to get to that place where God has called them and created them and designed them to be. And so when I, when, when I read this, i got to be honest with you, I'm like, oh, my gosh, so much pressure. Like, that's pressure. Think about it. Like, I got to, it's my responsibility as a parent to help navigate my kid so that they don't miss where God's created them to do and to be. Like, that is stress city, y'all. That is so much pressure. And so because I understand that there's so much pressure, when I read that, I'm like, man, that's so much pressure. What I want us to do is I want to look at uh, a couple, some parents who, man, if, if there was any pressure, they were experiencing this type of pressure. And just some observations that we read from them. And these parents are Joseph and Mary. Listen, y'all, if anybody, if anybody had pressure yeah. of raising a kid, it's the parents of Jesus. <laughs> if anybody should have been freaked out about like, oh, my gosh, I can't screw this up. <laughs> it's the parents of the God in flesh, Jesus. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, and there's just some things that I think we can pull out. And listen, I understand in this room lies an eclectic group of people, some people who are parents, some who are parents of older people, some who are not parents, some who, like, don't want kids. And so, but I believe, like, this doesn't just relate to, uh, to parenting, but I think it could just relate to loving your neighbor. Like, I think it can relate to discipling people. And so, so what, and I say that because I don't, if you don't have any kids, like, I don't want you to just tune out, okay? Like, just lean in, and I, and, and I believe that, that we can get something out of that. And so, so we're going to look at Joseph and Mary, and we know that they did a decent job. Because we read at the very beginning, Luke chapter 2, verse 40, that this child grew up healthy, he grew up strong, he was filled with wisdom, and God's favor was on him. So we know that Mary and Joseph did a decent job. We know that Mary and Joseph did, uh, they did, he, they did a, a decent job because Jesus ended up on the cross. That was, like, think about that. Like, as parents, like, they, they were prepared. They knew he was the Savior, and they were prepping him for the cross. May, they may not have known the exact destination of what it is, but they knew that he was the Savior, and he knew that there would be, they knew that there would be some type of sacrifice. And so they... Through the life of Jesus, as they were raising him, they were preparing him for his purpose, for his destination set by the designer. So we're going to look at four observations uh, for Joseph and Mary in uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 13. And it says this, after the wise men were gone and the angel, ooh, let's try it again. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. The angel said, get up, flee to Egypt. With the child in his mother, with the child in his mother, the angel said, stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Here's the first thing. Uh, number one, parents protect. Parents protect. Here's what's going on. Uh, uh, Joseph, Mary, they just had their baby, baby Jesus. He's just chilling. He's doing the baby thing, just, you know, like just chilling. And uh, they chill, right? And, uh, and, and, and so, so they're, he's just, and, and then all of a sudden they're asleep, right? And, and the text, that scripture that we just read says that, um, that while they were sleeping, 
the Lord came to Joseph and was like, hey, I need you to get up and go to Egypt because Herod is trying to harm your baby. Herod is trying to harm your baby. And so what I want us to see is this idea that parents protect. Because it says that Joseph got up, he got his wife, he got his kid, and they, they left. But here's what's interesting to me, is that the Lord didn't speak to baby Jesus and didn't say, baby Jesus, Herod's trying to kill you. You need to get up, pack up right now, and go. No. The text says that the Lord woke up who? Joseph. Who's Joseph? The parent. So, so God didn't, the Lord didn't wake up baby Jesus. He spoke to the dad. He spoke to the parent. He spoke to Jesus' parent. Here's why I think that's so important. Because we can't allow our kids to determine what they think is safe and what they think is harmful. Because there's a discernment that God gives to parents that far surpasses the understanding of a little kid. And so, so, so the Lord, he's speaking to Joseph. He's like, Joe, you got to wake up. Herod's trying to harm your baby. And he gets up. Here's what's also interesting is that Joseph, he heard the Lord speak in his dream. So can I propose to you this morning that, uh, that protect, par- protecting as a parent, there's an alignment with also like a spiritual sense as well. That like as a parent, if I want to protect my kid, I also have to get close to God. Because he's going to be speaking to me. He's going to be giving me wisdom on how I can, how I can throw red flags like, hey, buddy, don't, don't date her. <laughs> She's dangerous. <laughs> Baby girl, don't, don't, don't date him. He's a knucklehead. <laughs> hey, don't hang out with those kids. They're trouble. And so, so this idea like we're here, we're called to protect our kids. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 41, it says this. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover, Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they attended the festival as usual. So parents don't just protect, but parents model what they expect. Parents model what they expect. So we know that for at least 12 years, uh, that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus traveled to Jerusalem to attend the festival of Passover. So we know that for 12 years, they were consistent at modeling what was important to them. There's two phrases in verse 41 and verse 42 that I think are very important. That uh, It's these two things. That... Uh, what are those two things? Come on, man. <laughs> that every year, the phrase every year, and then the phrase attended as usual. So it said every year, and they attended as usual. What, like, what, is, what are these phrases implying? This idea that they were consistent. That they were consistent. That it wasn't something that they were just telling, but they were showing. They were doing Listen, as parents, there is no greater influence in your kid's life than you. And if I can add to that, it's, it has nothing to do with what you say, but rather what you show. It's about what I'm showing, not just what about, about what I'm saying. Like, what am I modeling to my kids? Do what I tell my kids model what I'm showing? Like, when I'm like, hey... Be kind to people. And then someone cuts me off. I'm like, hey! <laughs> Am I modeling what I say? Do they align? Now, here are three things that I think are very, like, obviously, there's a lot of things that we can model as parents. But here are three things that I think are very important to model. And you don't have to do them, obviously. It's America. Do what you want. But, like, 
Three of the best things to model. The first one is this, humility. Humility. I think, I think modeling humility as a parent is so important. Specifically, humility in the form of repentance. Humility in the form of, hey, I messed up. Humility in the form of, man, I know I just yelled at you. I'm sorry. Like humility. That's the first thing. The second thing to model is grace. To show something that, that they don't deserve. My wife hates when I do this because she's always like, you show them so much grace. Because I'm like, hey, you're grounded. No Xbox. And then my son's like, my son's like, okay, dad. And I'm like, oh, I'm just kidding, man. You're, hey, I just, <laughs> like, I just want to show him grace. I, like, and, and so, like, but I think that there's something to that, to show, to modeling grace, right? Because God shows us grace. So humility, grace, and here's the second, the third thing, excuse me, is honor. I think we've got to learn to, as parents, to model honor. Like modeling, our, or excuse me, honoring our spouse, honoring our parents, honoring each other, honoring our kids. And here's why I think these three things are, are extra important is because studies have shown that as a kid, or excuse me, studies have shown that, that your perception of God is first seen through how you see specifically your father, but I think it could be your mother as well. And so, so if that, that's why I think there's a lot of people who, like, when they try to, to, um, to start this, this walk with Jesus, like, it's hard for them. It's because they've had a bad relationship with their father or their mother. And because dad walked out, mom walked out, now all of a sudden it's like, oh, man, I think God's going to walk out of me. And so that's why I think it's so important to model humility, grace, and honor because I want my kids to see God as humble, full of grace, full of honor. Right? So um, parents model what they expect. Let's keep reading. Verse 43. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him at first because they assumed he was among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up, in the, show up that evening, they started looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they couldn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking questions. So four observations. Number one, parents protect. Number two, parents model what they expect. And number three, parents doesn't mean perfection. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> parents, parent doesn't mean perfection. I don't know if you notice, I'm not even sure if the verses are up there, but so as we read the text, here's what's happening. Uh, they, they're leaving the festival um, and they're headed back home and Joseph and Mary, they get back home and they realize, where's baby Jesus? <laughs> Mary's like, I thought you had baby Jesus. Joseph's like, I thought you had baby Jesus. <laughs> like nobody has baby, like listen, listen, listen. If there's ever grace for you as a parent, and you ever feel like, man, I dropped the ball, <laughs> just think about losing baby Jesus, okay? <laughs> and you should be so much better. So, so they're like, I don't have baby Jesus. Nobody has baby Jesus. And the, te the scripture says that, that <laughs> the third day they realized, and they went back to the So three days, at least three days, nobody knows where baby Jesus is. Nobody, they're like, they have no clue. They're like, oh, maybe he's with the group that was with us. They didn't have him. They went to their neighbor's house. Uh, baby Jesus here? <laughs> like, like, no, why would he be here, right? Like, they ask him, family member, um, hey, mom, is baby Jesus with you? <laughs> no. Like, they're looking for baby Jesus. It's crazy. And so, like, they can't find baby Jesus, so they head back to uh, Jerusalem, and they find baby Jesus. They find baby Jesus, and notice where they found baby Jesus. They found baby Jesus. Probably wasn't that much of a baby now, but, yeah. 
Baby Jesus just sounds fun, though, right? Like, <laughs> I just like saying baby Jesus, so deal with it. Uh, I'm just kidding. So not baby Jesus. Adolescent, bratty baby Jesus. No, that's, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We love teenagers. Come on. Uh, they're amazing. Um, so i got to focus. Uh, so, so they find Jesus in the temple listening f- with, with all the religious leaders there. I think that's huge. Out of everywhere that they could have found Jesus, he could have been shooting craps in the corner. He could have, like, he could have been anywhere. But where is Jesus? He's in the temple. I think this is, this is very important to what we just talked about in point number two. That I think Mary and Joseph, and obviously the divinity of who Jesus is, drew him there too. But I think, I think that the consistency of, 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 of his mom and dad like led him. Hey, mom and dad always come to this place. It's a safe place. And so he, here's what I want us to notice with, with this, this verse is that even in Joseph and Mary's imperfection, like even when they messed up, when they failed, when they dropped the ball, Jesus was so trained that I think his eyes were more on, less on what they did wrong, and his eyes were more on the consistency of what they showed. So this idea like, man, I may not be perfect, but that my kids know that I love Jesus so much that their eyes aren't fixed on me when I mess up. It doesn't determine their love for Jesus because because I've modeled for them, right? This idea like, hey, love Jesus with all your heart. Like this idea that, that man, I may not be perfect, but, but in my imperfections, like somehow by the grace of God, my imperfections are still pointing my kids to Jesus. And I think there's something huge about that. So number three, parents, uh, parent doesn't mean perfection. Number four, this last one, and we can have the keys come up. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 48. As his parents didn't know what to think, son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. But why do you need to search, he asked. Don't you know that I must be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he meant. (laughs) Then he, uh, verse 51, then he returned to Nazareth and them, with them, and was obedient to him. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. So, Mary and Joseph, they head back to the temple. They head back to the temple, and uh, they, they, they realize that Jesus is in this temple where he's supposed to be, or where, he, where they found him. And here's what's beautiful about this. Whoa, they they annoyed me. (laughs) Come on, John, you could have pretended like that didn't happen, right? Like, you always got to point out the obvious. (laughs) That's amazing. And we see obedient. This is what happens when you have ADHD. (laughs) Cheers. So, number one, parents protect. Number two, parents model what they expect. Number three, parent doesn't mean perfection. Number four, parents correct. Parents correct. So Joseph and Mary, they're headed back from the Passover festival. They realize they lost him, not baby Jesus. They head back. They find him. And then we read in verse, uh, we read in verse 48, Mary starts to correct Jesus. She's like, what? Like, where have you been? Like, why? Why did you do this? Right? Specifically, she says, 
She says, uh, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. So she's correcting Jesus. Like, what are you thinking, Jesus? Like, why did you do this? And here's what I want us to notice, is that her correction leads to obedience. Because in verse 51, it says, uh, Then they returned with him, and he was obedient to them. Listen, when I correct, the goal of my correction for my kids is to lead to repentance and obedience, not rebellion. So when I correct my kid, like my goal is not to get them to rebel against me even more. John, you don't have a teenager. I know, I know. We can update this message in two years. But, but this idea, what I really want us to just hone in on is, is, is that, that, um, this, that Jesus, like, his mom corrected him, right? And his response to it was obedience. And so, again, the goal, when I correct my kids, and Scripture talks about correcting our kids, that's the thing. Uh, you don't have to. It's America. But, like, Scripture talks about it. That when I correct my kid, it should lead them to obedience. To them becoming obedient. And the way that I do that is by correcting my kids, not out of anger, but out of love. See, Mary could have been like, Jesus, what? Get over here. God. Joseph, tell, talk to your boy. He could have gone down different ways. But I think that the way that Mary and Joseph addressed Jesus, like it led to obedience. Like it led to, to, to a change of heart. The other day we're at church. We're, uh, I had my kids with me. And uh, my son got out of the car, my youngest, the one that I let drive, right? <laughs> Maybe after this I shouldn't have let him drive, like, do anything really so he gets out of the car and he jumped like right over here and he runs to the door right here and as he's running to the door I swear to you this car is driving fast man no joke I'm not even because I'm drama by nature but this is not drama like the, he was he was probably like two to three feet away from the car and I was like <laughs> Like, everything inside of me, I just wanted to, like, Sonoma County whoop him. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come on. Come on. We give our kids oats and grain here. We love it. Like, everything in me. Like, I wanted to just, like, lay into him. Like, don't you ever, ever. <laughs> Come on. I just wanted to lay into him, man. But I felt something like come over my heart. Correct him, but in a manner of love so that he can learn from it. And so like, we just had like this little moment where, where I was like, hey man, and we just, I just broke it down to him. And I was like, do you understand what dad's saying? And he said, yes. And then as we were leaving here, he pushed through that door, and he, he was about to run, but then he stopped, and he waited till I got there. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. This would have been a horrible illustration if that didn't work out that way. <laughs> There's a way to correct where it's not just out of anger, but it's out of love. I think culture teaches us, hey, don't even correct. But I think that if we correct in the right way, love. Scripture says that God corrects those he loves. Come on. 
Four observations. Thank you, Mary and Joseph. Parents protect. Parents model what they expect. It doesn't mean perfection, but we also correct. Parents correct. 